Hello and welcome, this is Mouse Gunner, and in this video I'm going to continue with my series covering how striker fired actions work. In the last video in this series, I covered the Dreyse model of 1907, which served as an introduction to semi automatic pistol design. In this video, we're going to look at an example of a Luger P08, which shares the same basic fundamentals of a striker fired semi automatic design, but executed in a more complex and different way. As already stated, the basic idea behind a striker fired action remains the same as our earlier examples in this series, in that a spring loaded striker is used as a means to strike and ignite the primer. We also have the same design concerns with the Luger as we did with the Dreyse, needing a way to disconnect the trigger to allow for semi automatic fire, and with any firearm, it is important to mitigate the chance of the pistol firing out of battery. With safety in mind, I will also discuss the operation and mechanics behind the manual safety on our example in this video. The Luger being a more complex design, it is a little more challenging identifying the relevant parts. At the moment, the striker is cocked, or in other words, the striker is currently held back by the sear ready to fire. In the case of the Luger, the sear is part of a greater piece called the sear bar. When the trigger is pulled, it will pivot up and to the rear. This will simultaneously pull down on a part called the trigger lever, which in turn pivots and pushes inward on the sear bar plunger, moving the sear bar along with it, which finally pivots so that the rear section of the sear bar, the end where the sear holds the striker, is pushed outward, removing the contact of the sear and striker, releasing the striker to be driven forward by its spring into the primer, igniting the cartridge. That is a lot to take in all at once, but if we focus on just the most important interaction, the pull of the trigger causing the sear bar to pivot out of contact with the striker, releasing it, the basic operation becomes a little more clear. The sear bar plunger is also important, and we will see its function in more detail later. Adding to the complexity when compared to the previous example of the Dreyse, the Luger is a toggle link, short recoil action as opposed to the Dreyse straight blowback operation. What that means is that the Luger is a lock breech design. The bolt and receiver are locked together when the action is closed, and being a short recoil operated action, they will remain locked for a short distance as they are both driven rearwards by the recoil impulse of the fired cartridge. A toggle link works like the joint of a knee. When it is locked straight, a force along the line of the joint will not break the lock and it will remain firm. But a force going opposite the joint can break the lock and allow the joint to bend and move. The force needed to bend the joint happens when the knob at the rear of the toggle link strikes a sloped surface at the rear of the frame, forcing the knob to cam along the sloped surface upwards. Once the toggle has broken its rigid lock, the recoil impulse pushing back on it will break the bolt free of the receiver as the toggle pivots up and to the rear. The barrel and receiver assembly will hit the end of its travel while the bolt continues to the rear, opening the action, extracting and ejecting the spent cartridge case. As the rear toggle link moves upwards, it will also, through a series of interacting parts, compress the mainspring. The rear toggle link is attached via a link to the mainspring lever. As the rear link moves upward, it in turn pulls up on the mainspring lever. Hooked onto the bottom side of the lever is the mainspring's guide rod. As the lever is pulled up, it also pulls the guide rod along with it. As the guide rod moves up, it compresses the mainspring between itself and the frame. Once the bolt reaches the end of its rearward travel, a reverse interaction will happen with these parts to pull the rear toggle link back down into the locked position. The compressed spring will push down on the guide rod, which in turn pulls the lever downward, and through the chain of connected parts, the rear link itself gets pulled down. As the rear toggle link comes downwards, it also pushes the bolt back forward. This forward travel of the bolt strips the next cartridge from the magazine into the chamber and brings the action into a closed and locked position. Another thing that will happen during this forward travel is the striker being caught by the sear and held so that it comes back to the fully cocked position, compressing the striker spring as the bolt comes forward. Although the cocking of the sear seems simple enough and follows a similar interaction to what we have seen before with previous examples I have showcased, there are a couple subtle interactions that are important to point out 
and that is how the trigger reset works and how the design tries to ensure that the pistol does not fire out of battery. For a semi-automatic design, it is important for the trigger to be deactivated until it has been sufficiently released. This happens as the bolt comes forward and locks up with the receiver, driving it forward along with it. The sear bar is attached to the receiver, so it moves along with the receiver as it moves back and then forward again. If the trigger is still held in during this forward travel, the sear bar plunger will contact the trigger lever and be forced back inside the sear bar, compressing its return spring. This is important as with the trigger still held in, the trigger lever can no longer act on the sear bar. It is not until the trigger is released far enough that the sear bar plunger will be allowed to spring back into position so that the trigger can act on it again. The out of battery safety mechanism, or in other words, the mechanism that prevents the cartridge from being fired when the action is not fully closed, is built into the shape of the toggle link and the striker. On the left side of the forward toggle link is a lobe that, when the toggle joint is bent, extends down in front of the striker. On the side of the striker is a sloped lug that is raised up enough to contact the lobe. In this way, if, for some reason, the seer was to release the striker at a time when the action was not fully closed, the lobe on the toggle link would catch it, preventing it from striking the primer of an out-of-battery cartridge. While we are talking about mechanisms designed for safety, it is high time I describe the function of the manual safety in one of these examples. Our previous examples had manual safeties that functioned in one of two ways. The first way was used by the two bolt action examples I showcased, where the manual safety blocks the striker from coming forward. The second way, found in the Dreyse model of 1907, had the safety block the sear, preventing it from moving away from its contact with the striker. The Luger uses this later method of blocking the sear. When the safety is activated, a bar comes up and physically blocks the sear bar from moving outward, preventing it from letting go of the striker. And with that, I will wrap up my video on the Luger P08. The Luger is a complex design, and as a result, this overview may not have been all that easy to follow. The good news is that things will get simpler as we move on through future examples of striker-fired actions. So if you made it through this video okay, you should have no trouble with those future examples. If you did struggle with understanding the Luger design, the best advice I can give is breaking things into small groups and only focusing on how the parts in that group work with each other to achieve a task and go from there until you see the full picture, one step at a time. In any case, I hope you have enjoyed the video. This is Mouse Gunner, signing out.